Welcome one and all and wish you a very happy Teacher's Day. Teacher's Day is celebrated every year in India to commemorate the birth anniversary of Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. He was uh, our former president, a great scholar, philosopher and Bharat Ratna recipient. This is also the day when learners and educators get together to remember the importance of education and celebrate the contributions of those who make it happen. We at IIITB have been having this special Samvad session for Teacher's Day, wherein we get a distinguished luminary in the field of education to share their thoughts on education and related topics. Today, we have a very distinguished speaker among us who will be introduced by our session chair for the day. Let me introduce the session chair for today. Professor Srinath Srinivasa heads the Web Science Lab and is the Dean R&D at Triplity Bangalore, India. He works in the area of web science that models the impact of web, that is World Wide Web, on humanity. humanity. Srinath has a keen interest in diverse scholarly subjects like philosophy, education, and many others, and is a scholar in Indian philosophy uh, itself, and that kind of makes him an apt session chair for today's uh, uh, session also. So without uh, standing between you and uh, the session chair, I welcome Srinath Srinivasa to chair the session and introduce the speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sujit, uh, for the kind introduction. And so, uh, Professor Sujit, for mentioning, uh, it's my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker for the distinguished lecture, uh, for the, the distinguished somewhat lecture that we have uh, every year on Teacher's Day. Uh, Professor U.P. Desai is, uh, is no stranger to TKITB. In fact, uh, if I remember, uh, uh, he has already also delivered a keynote address once in one of our previous uh, uh, RISE uh, symposium at TKITB. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the speaker. Uh, 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 firstly, uh, uh, thanks, uh, sir, for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, uh, Professor Desai is an alumnus of uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, he finished his BTEC in uh, 1974 from IIT Kanpur and uh, from uh, SUNY State University of New York in Buffalo. In, uh, he uh, received his uh, MS degree in 1976 and uh, uh, PhD from the Johns Hopkins University of Baltimore in, in the US in 1979. Uh, all of them were in electrical engineering. Uh, he, is, uh, uh, he was the founding director of IIT Hyderabad uh, and uh, from uh, June 2009 to June 2019. And uh, uh, he also served as a mentor director for uh, Triple IT Chitu, uh, GCT, uh, IIT Pillai, and uh, he, at present he is also a professor emeritus at uh, IIT Hyderabad. Uh, he's also the chancellor for Anurag University in Hyderabad, chancellor for uh, uh, ICFAI University in Dehradun, and uh, honorary distinguished uh, professor at uh, Plaksha University. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, he also received uh, the outstanding alumni award from uh, the University of Buffalo, his alma mater in 2015, and uh, in 2016, he received the Distinguished Alumni Award from uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, he's a fellow of INSA, Indian National Science Academy, uh, INAE, the Indian National Academy of uh, uh, Engineering, and he's also the recipient of uh, JC Bose Fellowship uh, uh, for Excellence in Teaching, and, uh, and also the recipient of uh, uh, Excellence in Teaching Award from IIT Bombay. So, and uh, his research interests are in the areas of uh, wireless communication, wireless sensor networks, uh, cyber physical systems, IoT, and AI. He's, he's authored uh, nine research monographs and has graduated uh, for 25 PhD students and over 100 uh, master's students. So once again, uh, we welcome you, sir, uh, for the uh, first distinguished lecture and uh, uh, on innovations in academics. And thank you very much. Uh, I would like to first of all thank your director, Professor Das, uh, thanks, uh, Srinath, uh, uh, Professor Sujit, as well as uh, Jaya for uh, inviting me, and also thanks to the full Sambar team. Uh, it's indeed my pleasure and, in fact, my honor to give this particular talk on innovations in academics on uh, Teacher's Day. And it's a very special day, as we all know. Okay. Uh, and uh, my association with IIIT Bangalore has been quite long, uh, so I'm really happy to address 
uh, the audience at Triple IT in Bangalore. I wish I could have been there in person, uh, but I guess in today's time, you know, this is perhaps the next best thing. So just give me a second. I'll see if I can. Okay. Uh, so let me just start off with some kind of a small kind of remark. You know, I mean, this is something which seems to be the uh, in thing nowadays. Though this cartoon illustrates uh, what happens in school, somehow in colleges also something similar seems to be happening nowadays. You know, as the teacher says, as the mother says, you know, what did you learn in school today? And uh, the girl who has daughter who has come back and says, not enough. They want me to go back tomorrow. Okay. And I think we need to kind of address that. You know, why is this uh, 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 problem occurring? Uh, there is no single solution to this. Uh, in my opinion, nobody has a solution. There are a plethora of suggestions and ideas. And what I'm going to also propose are some of ideas and suggestions that I have and some which I've experimented with. But, you know, in some sense, the canvas is open. And, and I think we all need to put our heads together to tackle this particular problem. Okay. So another two quotes I'd like to start off with, you know, and this is something we have forgotten over the years where evaluations, exams, you know, grading, you know, certain structure, submissions of homeworks in time, assignments, projects, et cetera, have taken over. You know, what Feynman says out here, teach your students to doubt, to think, to communicate, to question, to make mistakes, to learn from their mistakes, and most importantly, have fun in their learning. Frankly, I feel over the years, particularly the last two, three decades, slowly and slowly, the fun of learning is going away. And uh, as professors, we always keep blaming the student, but actually the fault lies with the academic ecosystem and not with the students. They, of course, change with time and they perhaps change much more rapidly with time than we do. So I think we need to keep that. Another thing which I like, and in some sense, it is related to you know, the kind of things that uh, Feynman is talking about, another famous physicist, Freeman Dyson. And he says, dissent is the soul of science. And I think dissent is also essential in an academic ecosystem. You know, today, slowly and slowly it is eroding and essentially we are developing a, a conformist ecosystem. I think that is also taking away a lot of fun. When I question, when I have the freedom to question, it gives me that particular environment where both sides are discussing, debating, you know, and it is not a one-way traffic. For some reason, and it, it's a far more complex thing, you know, we, 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 there is a conformist kind of an approach coming in, and it has nothing to do with any specific institution. You know, I think all institutions, to some extent, even in U.S. universities, which were perhaps most non-conformist at one time, again, conformism has become the order of the day. You know, and conformism, I would say, is not simply you follow orders of the president or the director or the dean, no. It is more in terms of a certain structure which has evolved where if you look at it, the time for free thinking, the time for brainstorming, the time for you know, <clears throat> laughing, smiling, you know, uh, 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 and interacting with students has become much smaller. Even in your own career, those of you who have been around for say 15, 20 years in academics, you'll remember, 20 years ago, you had more time to sit with students and chat and have a cup of coffee. Today, we are all running, submitting proposals, getting funding, sending UCs, you know, managing funds after you get funding, et cetera, et cetera. And then you know, running for lectures, you know, then conducting exams, what, what have you. And finally, the time, which is to me most crucial that is spending with students in an informal setting, that is going down day by day. So what I have to start with, you know, this is a broad thing. I think I'm going to skip this particular slide. All of us are aware of it. Most of us are in the teaching community. So I will not spend time. You know, what I'd like to talk about is uh, uh, briefly mentioned is a very interesting report by, uh, uh, you know, by this World Bank, uh, you know, WDR 2019. It's about three years ago, but still I think it has, it's quite interesting. You know, what we normally talk about is, you know, technological know-how, problem solving, critical thinking. These are like big components that we want to incorporate in our academic ecosystem, particularly in technological institutions. What they mention out here are three more things, which I have it in the middle, you know, and I think these are quite interesting. Perseverance, collaboration, empathy. In some sense, all three are in empathy is probably the least in some sense in our ecosystem. Collaboration to some extent is there, not as much. Perseverance is very individual dependent. We don't really quite encourage it, pursue it. You know, some people can do night out, some may not be able to. 
Okay. Of course, the other things are well known, lifelong learning and something at the bottom I have added, that is my own kind of a thing, which I think it is very important to have unstructured education. There is too much structure in today's education. Okay. And I'll come to that as I go along. Now I have a whole bunch of questions and these questions are not all mine. I think some came from reading documents and reports here and there, like the World Bank document. Also spending a lot of time with the faculty members at IIT Hyderabad with whom I used to sit and chat and discuss that how we can change things. And they themselves had certain concerns as to what are the issues and how they can change. And there was a time when I had time, they had time and we could sit and kind of debate and deliberate and some innovations came out, which I'll describe in my talk as I go along. Okay. Does the curriculum need a complete overhaul, for example? You know, we can make incremental changes. The deltas keep adding up. Uh, and I think perhaps we need a lot more than deltas, you know. Now, what are the right models of learning? We don't even debate that. There are very sort of, you know, pedantic talks which are there. Okay. Nobody is really giving an out-of-box model for uh, learning, you know. This we have accepted, particularly during pandemic, it became very evident. And I guess it is making strong, you know, forces of technology and globalization are transforming higher education. And all of us have done something or the other to incorporate this. You know, what is happening to a traditional university? Some feel that it is being disrupted. During pandemic, many people said that, oh, now with online education, it's the end of a university. I don't think so, but universities will have to change. Okay. You know, why lack of motivation that I talked about in my first uh, sort of cartoon that I displayed, you know, both these things, you know, why uneven student interest? Some students are very serious, some are not. Where, the, where is the problem? This is a perennial question. How do we bridge the gulf between theory and practice? And this will always be, as long as uh, universities are around, these two questions will always be there. You know, breadth and depth, that has been there. And again, here we need to kind of come up with a proper uh, uh, compromise between breadth and depth. You know, relevance of non-core subjects. Now, this is a critical thing. And we sometimes, when I'm passionate about electrical engineering or somebody is passionate about computer science, we forget the value of non-core courses. I'll talk a little bit about it. Like flexibility. If you look at our curriculum today, except for a few electives, the flexibility is very little. I'll talk a little more about it as I go along. Some things we have done. We have not tackled all the questions, some of them. How to space the curriculum based on individual potential. You know, we have a curriculum, we have an academic approach where one size, one fits all. Okay, In spite of NEP and other things that are there, it is still in some sense a size that fits all. And I think that may not necessarily be the best thing. Multidisciplinarity has talked a lot about it. I've put, kept it in here because it's a mandatory kind of a thing. Okay, Industry interactions, we all keep debating and discussing and we all want to increase that. You know, there also, there are some thoughts that I have. Hopefully, I'll get time to elaborate on that. Okay. Uh, research in undergraduate education, I think this is crucial. Though the word is research, I think it's like saying that undergraduate education has to change fundamentally where they do things rather than they simply give NSEMs and MIDSEMs. You know, bringing design and creativity in education, particularly engineering education. I think this is very crucial. We have done very little on it. You know, uh, Problem solving critical thinking, I talked about it when I mentioned the World Bank report. You know, the other part which I've been saying a lot is are we pumping too much information into our students? You know, we all want to have more and more courses and we feel the more courses a student takes, okay, the smarter he'll become or he'll be, or she'll be a lot more knowledgeable and get a better job, etc. And I'll briefly touch upon this as I go on. Okay. And, uh, you know, why so many questions, okay? I'm, I'm sure there are many more one can add. Many of you have something. If you ask me, I'll note it down. And in my next presentation, I'll incorporate them. You know, I like this statement from Feynman again. You know, I would rather have questions that cannot be answered than answers that cannot be questioned. And in some sense, again, going back to dissent, the freedom to question. Okay. Now, this, a few things that we try to do, and you know, I've done it at IIT Hyderabad, what we try to do. When I say uh, what we tried to do, or I did it, was during the time span between 2009 to 2019. Okay. So some of the things we try to incorporate, and I think you can see that these are things which I covered in the question that I had, so I won't spend too much time. Fundamentally, what I think is we need to break the mold if we want to innovate. And you cannot have one particular formula for breaking the mold. You know, currently, the trend is there are a few people who will sit, they will talk to, consult various people, come up with a document, and then everybody has to follow that document. I don't think that has to approach. I think there has to be freedom for each institutions, particularly institutions like IIIT Bangalore, to evolve their own document. 
their needs are very different than iit bombay or for that matter icer pune you know or, or maybe you know central university hyderabad etc and they need to evolve as to how best they can create a dynamic and ever evolving academic ecosystem so we need to break the mold i think you know, that's the only way out our mold is too old too rigid uh one of the things i talk about and i'm putting it right at the beginning you know this is something i learned from japan we all talk of maker lab government also has a lot of uh, uh, initiative on maker labs you know that is you know i think atal innovations lab or maker labs and they give funding to everybody which is very good you know what i learned from japan they have something which i have termed as a breaker lab i don't know exactly what they call it but maybe a rough translation of what they had and what they do is quite interesting you know and this is something i learned from a professor at university of tokyo so we are not talking about some small universities uh, university of tokyo was leading ones what they do is you know you you essentially have a lab where you buy things of course they can afford to buy maybe in our case we will get it from some uh, you know used uh, 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 equipment seller or a kabadi wala as they say you know in bombay and other places so they would go to a place called akihabara some of you might have heard of it if you have visited japan and they would buy inexpensive cameras you know TVs they had some used cars you know they would buy cell phones you know rotary phones if they can get one washing machines electric meters etc etc and the task of students in which were broken up into the groups was to break open one piece of equipment for example you take this washing machine okay so called fuzzy control washing machine we can buy it in india also Okay. Now break it open and see what is it that goes into the machine. And their approach was that it is important first to break open things and learn. Then you go to a maker lab and then you start making things. Okay. And I think this is quite important, perhaps more so for people like uh, students in India, because bulk of the students in India don't get a chance to actually do things. If you look at most of your students in school and all. today they don't really do laboratory experiment there is a teacher which does the experiment and the students watch maybe some private schools you know which have a lot of funding you get a chance to do the experiments but in terms of breaking open you know i, I normally ask a question for example you know you can ask your students i am almost certain none of your students would have ever opened a toaster and seen how a toaster works something so elementary even if you mess it up you lose maybe a few hundred rupees it's not a very expensive piece of Uh, uh, gadgetry that we have in the kitchen, okay. but you learn out there, you know how how does the damn thing work? The timers and other things, you know. For example, we all have a hard disk. We all talk about hard disk. How many students in Triple I D Bangalore have ever broken open a hard disk? And these hard disks are thrown away, by the way, after this. They last for what? Three years, four years, five years. Either they become too small, you know, we have gone from megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes. and you then you throw away because this space is not enough it is too slow etc etc but how many have done that so my feeling is that we need to encourage this you know this learning by doing involves breaking things and this is something you know it very difficult i have not been able to persuade too many people to accept this philosophy but i wish more and more universities some private universities that i interact with they have started to incorporate a portion of this particular part you know the other thing which we want to change the education ecosystem okay we all talk about ict you know which all of us are doing you know we have smart classrooms you know i'll also mention a little bit as i go along then we talk about uh, 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 you know incorporating you know, nice ppts and then maybe interactive whiteboards you know tablets you know uh, students can ask questions they will show up etc etc okay so lots of things will come up that we are doing but what we have what i feel the future classrooms will have to be collaborative classrooms okay and what i mean by this is a picture what you see on the right side is what we are planning to build at iit hyderabad this is what is there in the architectural design of course the classroom is being built i just hope that the current uh, uh, leadership at iit hyderabad will implement a classroom of this nature so if you see this you have this oblong shaped or elliptical shaped desks okay and you have typically maybe 6 to 8 students sitting around it okay that's what essentially the idea is rather than rows and columns what we have today in typical classroom now what you do out here is it the professor now has to change the mode of lecturing you are not lecturing anymore okay what you do is you talk a little bit maybe for 10 15 minutes 
then pose a problem let the students in this particular group all the each group discuss that particular problem okay they may have a solution they may not have a solution that is immaterial the uh, correct answer is not the key thing the, the idea is to brainstorm on that particular question and after about 5 7 minutes of discussion okay the professor can ask one of the groups to present their thoughts and then have some discussion with the rest of the class about whatever the proposition that was made or the answer that was given by one particular group obviously in one lecture you can't cover all of them but over the semester you can cover almost all the desk and each one will get multiple opportunities to present answers to different questions so this is what i call as collaborative classroom many of them are talking about it but i think you know it's it's a it's, it's very easy for me to describe this but to actually do teaching is possible by the way i have been part of conferences where people have done that okay many times when you want to brainstorm and particularly these are workshops where you want to evolve things okay you want to evolve a vision document for example we had done that when we we developed a vision document for iit hyderabad and in fact that was they helped bcg had helped us at that time boston consultancy global and this is exactly what they had done you had small small teams each team will discuss then they will vote on a particular question and at the end of it a certain kind of a consensus and a document was uh, evolved i think this can be done for teaching even you know computer science programming etc etc okay i'll give an example you know uh, i'm involved with uh, a company called talent sprint it is an edtech company uh, currently and now it is owned by national stock exchange okay they have an academy now there there is one guy called ashokan and i was just chatting with him and the way he teaches python programming you know typically one would go and start describing what is python programming how is it different from c how is it different from c++ java etc then you give sample code nothing he walks in the classroom and that's what i liked about it okay and he gives a simple problem and he tells the student this is the very first lecture that he walks in write a python code for solving this simple problem the problem could be maybe multiplying 2 by 2 two matrices that's all 2 cross 2 you know so a matrix a multiplied by b both of them are 2 cross 2 very simple we can do it orally he walks out of the classroom the students have access to in internet everything you know they spend about half an hour 45 minutes and then they come up with a code he comes back in the last 15 minutes and says okay now show me your code some codes are good some are bad some are correct some are not correct some are partially done okay and then he discusses what the mistakes they had made how it should be changed etc etc and this is how they learn python programming okay and i thought this is much better than the conventional model of how at least i studied programming or even today how programming is being taught in the class and in some sense implicitly he was implementing the collaborative classroom model for teaching okay we have ar vr is little expensive today i hope it becomes cost effective and we can incorporate in our academic curriculum the other thing which i'd like to emphasize is unstructured learning okay and this kind of came up uh, you know in lot of discussions with that i used to have at iit bombay so the problems that i am talking about are not something which have evolved over the last 3 4 years and i have been observing this since i would say something like 2005 2006 in almost 17 years ago and this was experience at iit bombay one of the leading institutes in the country okay and i should discuss with my colleagues out there you know particularly uh, professor juzer wasi some of you might have heard of it he is a well known researcher of course he is also retired Uh, in nano electronics and photovoltaics now uh, the the thing that came up is we were wondering why students are not creative in classrooms you know why they are not creative in the laboratories and when we looked around when we discussed with students among us we found the students were actually quite creative in the hostels it was very funny whenever they had a hostel event the amount of technology that was used in the hostel event particularly the event in iit bombay called paf performing arts festival it's quite amazing the amount of electronics and software control things and all kinds of fancy things they do and then we so we started sort of jokingly saying that now time has come you know maybe to bring hostels into the classroom in the olden days we took hostel to the classroom to the hostel right so we put up computer labs in the hostels you know so that students had access to internet students would do some programming at night 
they will read at night we put up small libraries in the hostel so that students could go and study out there they have books access etc etc but now the time has come to be reversed and essentially this revolves around unstructured learning also if you talk to students you know who are alumni very they will clearly say that maybe sir if i'm generously speaking 25% of my learning came from classroom bulk of you know learning some people say 70 30 some say 80 20 you know i'm putting 70 30 by and large you know being a professor i like to be a bit generous to myself so the 30% came from classroom 70% of learning comes from outside the classroom and my mean by outside the classroom is all the projects that they do many technical activities that they have the the dining table discussions they have on technology on science the coffee table discussions that they have the discussions they have in the labs when the professor is not there or at late night in iits the labs are open 24/7 because the students are also on campus okay so 2 am in the morning 3 am in the morning they are discussing something now that learning is very strong and now the point is we need to see how we can create an essentially a unstructured model for teaching i think the structured model paid its dividends it had its time in the 60s 70s maybe even 80s to some extent 90s but 2000 onwards i think you know maybe the new millennium millennial kids whatever you want to call it whatever vocabulary you want to use it is losing its relevance okay so this is where i keep emphasizing that it is important to bring also if you think about it in life how many things do you do in a structured fashion even our research is highly unstructured it's only when i write the paper that i put structure into it but very rarely my research goes in a very structured manner that okay i will start with the objective then i will know observation then i will analyze the observation then i'll come up with conclusions etc it never happens that way nobody does research that way okay so why not incorporate this you know non linear thinking this non linearity unstructured this which is there in all our activities into our teaching curriculum extremely difficult i don't deny it but i think is time has come for us to take a attempt make an attempt we may fail in the first attempt it is likely the students may laugh at us it doesn't matter let them laugh okay they are our students finally okay but we need to experiment on this okay this relates to experiential learning whatever i just described so i won't spend too much time on it this is something all of you have been talking about in one forum or the other okay and in some sense to me unstructured learning is related to experiential learning breaker lab followed by maker lab is experiential learning okay so i've talked quite a bit about this you know so i leave it at this i have there there are questions later on more than happy to take them we need dynamism and modularity i think our education if you look at our academic ecosystem dynamism is gone you know it's like a fixed thing i have to teach this i have to teach that we never ask you know why is it necessary to teach this can't the students learn on their own has everything to be under the sun to be taught to them i don't think so you know institutions like triple id bangalore you know have very good students do we need to have so much structure and so much spoon feeding we need to ask that question you know i think we need to make the educational system very agile we need to keep changing things and i what we are doing is not and i'll tell you an example from iit bombay this was the time when i joined iit bombay in 87 and i used to have a lot of discussions with students or i think it was 89 or 90 when one of the students says sir i don't enjoy the lecture by so and so professor i said so why he is a very good teacher he says sir when i go there his notes have you know paper which looks yellow you know in india if you look at it because of the acid content in a paper the paper becomes yellow very quickly so for the student it was that these were the notes that the professor had prepared maybe 10 years 15 years 20 years ago and he is he's still teaching us from those notes that means the education that i am getting is not what is happening today but what happened 15 years ago 20 years ago and i think this was a message to me rather very early in my teaching career at iit bombay okay but it was not it is took some long time even today i don't think we have that kind of dynamism in our teaching you know i think we need to incorporate that that we need to incorporate the latest things we just think that no no they need to learn all these basics before they can learn this i don't think so i think unstructured manner you can go back and forth between the latest and the basics modularity will help you the reason i'm saying this is that uh, you know every course need not be a three credit course one semester 42 hours of lectures 
you know, two mid -sems, you know, one end -sem, you know, whatever, you know, maybe seven homeworks, eight homeworks or eight assignments, etc. This is a structure which is typically there. Numbers may vary a little bit here and there. Why should it be that way? You know, some courses may require 42 lecture hours to go through. Some may require maybe seven lecture hours. Some may require 14 lecture hours, etc. And we did work on it and I, we did evolve that and implement it in IIT Hyderabad, at least when I was there. And some remnants of it are still pros, uh, are there in IIT Hyderabad. And we called it fractal academics. I'll talk a bit about it as we go along. This is something I talked about, nonlinear thinking. Nonlinearity to me is related to unstructured. Okay. And, and I think that is something we never teach. And sometimes I feel our students also have difficulty in real life simply because real life is highly nonlinear. It is not linear the way we structure it and the way we teach it in colleges. And, and in some extent, if you look at uh, the movie Three Idiots, though without calling it nonlinear, you know, Raju Hirani is trying to kind of hint at it that the education system is too rigid, too structured, and not allowing unstructuredness and nonlinearity. Design thinking is very, very important. I think that we need to incorporate a lot. Okay, I think we have forgotten about it. Uh, most places do have a design department today, but again, that is dominated quite often by engineers. So it is more of engineering design and not creative design. We have NID, we have IDC at Bombay, then IIT Hyderabad is a design department, Gauhati has one, Delhi has one, I think Kanpur is just starting one. You know, many have sort of design schools and all, but they were started by mechanical department like IAC. Essentially, it is kind of dominated by mechanical engineering. And I think we need to get design done by designers, the creative thinkers, the architects and the visual designers, the ergonomics guys, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is something which is very important. This was outlined by the Kakotkar committee in one of the big reports that was prepared, I think maybe sometime between 2009 and 2014, maybe 13, I don't remember exactly, you know, around that time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, evaluation. I think too much emphasis is given to evaluation and, and, and we are obsessed with it in India in particular. Everywhere we want to have exams, 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 and we believe that if you crack the exam, you're smart. If you don't crack the exam, you're dumb. Life is not that way. You will find many of the successful people, entrepreneurs and others that your triple IT Bangalore has graduated are not necessarily the guys who always crack the exam. I'm not saying the guys who crack the exams are not doing well. They are all doing very well. Okay, I'm not denying that. You know, But they might have done better in case our emphasis on evaluation was a little less. And in some sense, it relates to the maker lab concept, experiential thinking, unstructured thinking. Because it is very difficult to evaluate the maker lab, very difficult to evaluate the breaker lab, very difficult to evaluate unstructured thinking. It is a lot easy for me to evaluate, you know, when I'm teaching a course, say, on communication systems, you know, or on artificial intelligence, and I give some exams, okay, and grade them. Okay, I think that era is gone. I think we need to evolve. I, again, I don't have answers to all the questions, okay. Uh, 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 we need to kind of chain things. Just uh, give, have some exams. I'm not saying have zero. You don't have to go from you know 100 to zero, but maybe the emphasis could be a lot less. And particularly if you are following project-based learning, obviously this change will be forced upon you. And it is okay if the student gets large number of student gets A's. It is not necessary that yes, you have to have a uniform distribution: 10% A's, 10% B's, 10% C's, etc. That need not necessarily be the case. So fractal academics we implemented in a, at IIT Hyderabad. This was way back, I think, uh, in 2016 or something we started. Uh, we started something called, a for the first, a digital fabrication lab for 3D printing. This was done by all the students. This was in 2012, okay, way back, you know, almost 10 years ago, and it's running successfully. Okay. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this as I go along. And see, this was essentially saying that, look, particularly in IITs, you have a workshop. And my feeling was the workshop has lost its relevance and let us replace workshop with 3D printing. You know, it worked out. Also, the other argument was show me one computer scientist whoever uses a hacksaw or a wood saw after he or she has graduated. Never. And for that matter, even many mechanical engineers who work in computational fluid dynamics never do that. Okay. But we insist on teaching all that cutting of metal and cutting of wood and grinding and all that stuff. So I said, look, that has lost its relevance. You know, with modern technology. That worked out well. 
we started a course on ai and humanity the idea was a minor out here you know i think it is still continuing i'm not 100% sure see the idea was we all do ai okay like there's a lot of ai going on at triple it uh, bangalore now the question is how is humanity going to interact with this ai and how is ai going to interact with humanities and i wanted this particular program to be actually and that's exactly what we did led by the humanities department by what we call the liberal arts department at iit hyderabad okay and a get the liberal arts and the humanities people to think about ai and let them lead because what are the humanity implications of ai how is the humanity going to change for good for better you know etc you and i are technology so bulk of the people attending this talk also are technologists and for them just ai itself is good but i think this is a very important part and you know these things are not something you know like this kind of a minor is not going to last for too long the day the charm of ai wears off maybe 8 10 years you know whatever this was started i think in 2018 or 17 maybe by 27 this minor will become irrelevant you get something else then start a minor on that and just discard it we need to also have a mechanism for closing things the sunset clause has to be there everywhere we start a minor in entrepreneurship today everybody has it but the unique thing that i had done in entrepreneurship in this minor which uh, unfortunately has been stopped and which nobody has it is that not a single module in this entrepreneurship was taught by the faculty of iit hyderabad every module was taught by an entrepreneur that is somebody who had been an entrepreneur somebody who is a venture capitalist okay or somebody who is still an entrepreneur okay so i had for example two founders one of the co-founders of hcl a multi billion dollar company okay uh, mr ajay choudhary okay he taught a module in minor in entrepreneurship i had bvr mohan reddy who has started a company called scient okay he taught a, a course on uh, in, in uh, uh, this thing minor in entrepreneurship and i had a collection of such people so the idea was i had a team of such people obviously many would teach for 2 years 3 years 5 years depends but then i could easily find a replacement because i have to tell them in fact okay i can understand you are busy can you suggest somebody and they would find and it worked out very well satish andhra was doing finance and things like that he is a venture capitalist after 2 years he says look you know i am too busy with my own company then i said you find me somebody so he found mr rimpal okay and rimpal came and started teaching that and students liked it because their connect now was not with iit faculty only but with entrepreneurs with venture capitalist with industrialist and so on and so forth i think this is the way to go about it in modern education everything need not be taught by the professors at the academic institution you know it is like the change that took place in the it industry where outsourcing became a very big thing if you go back pre 2000 okay pre y2k era okay Uh, uh, you will find that everything was done in house outsourcing was very little and suddenly people realized the value of outsourcing so i am not saying you outsource it in the exactly in the same model but at a very higher level a very similar kind of a philosophy needs to be inculcated we started a double major this is i would say not something very unique because this is very common in american universities in fact if you have nri friends and they have kids who go to college you will find half of the kids out there have a double major you know often maybe in computer science and statistics or maybe you know electrical engineering and biomedical engineering etc etc because anyway you do a large number of courses and partly this was motivated by one student you know he came and talked to me once he said sir i have done so many courses in mechanical engineering i have also done so many courses outside mechanical and computer science and he showed me the work that he had done all the electives this that he says i am missing only so many credits in computer science why don't you allow me to take this extra credits and i will do it in 4 years and now you give me two degrees btech in computer science and btech in mechanical engineering i took it to the senator and said that what the guy says makes a lot of sense and he is not asking to work less he is asking to work more okay so why not we give him an opportunity so we started this double major very similar to what people do it in and we said you take 4 to 5 years up to you if you are hard working and finish it there are some i would say in a class of maybe 100 to 4 5 are taking this option so this is where the myth that oh you know my life is ruined if i don't get computer science that got uh, debunked 
So I, because here in our system at IIT Hyderabad, they could get computer science B.Tech even if they were admitted in civil engineering or metallurgical engineering, as long as they were willing to work a little extra hard. Uh, another thing we started, this is something not done in, a student could take a year off, up to a year off, okay, without any reason, by the way. Normally, we give time off only if they have medical leave, right? So otherwise, we don't give any time off. So here, what I said is fine. You, know, you may feel you're burnt out. You want to take a year off to do entrepreneurship, a startup, etc. You may just want to travel. Like this idea came to me when I was teaching in US at Washington State University. This was way back in you know, 79, 80, 81 time frame. And uh, one year, I, uh, one semester, I didn't see a particular student. Nice guy, not the brightest. He was like in the middle of the class, but quite vocal, asked questions. He was quite friendly with me. And one semester, I didn't see him completely. So I asked, you know, when he, and then suddenly I saw him after a semester. And I said, hey, man, what happened? Are you okay? Is your health fine? I didn't see you for a whole semester. The guy says, you know, no, sir. You know, no, they don't say sir out there. He says, no, Dr. Desai. You know, I just took uh, time off and I was traveling through South America and uh, Mexico and Central America. And I just wanted to take some time, backpacking. Okay. Then it occurred to me when I came to India, that why don't we give such free time, backpacking in the Himalayas, backpacking in Ladakh, maybe just going around Kanyakumari to Kashmir, whatever they want to do. We just don't do that. We just occupy them in four years and man, hey, you slog, morning till evening, that's it. I think we should give some time off and this worked well. Uh, this will take a little time. Maybe I'll come back to it at the end because I can see that you know, my time is running out. We started a very unique department called Engineering Science and it's working very well. In fact, the graduates also have very strong feedback because they're doing extremely well. And I have a long story to talk about it. And I wish at the end, if time permits, remind me, I'll talk about the whole story on Engineering Science Department. It's a very unique uh, thing which only IIT Hyderabad has it. And in some sense, this occurred because with the faculty, I used to keep discussing that should we do something different? You know, and this came up. Then we started a creative arts series. I'll talk a little bit more about it, which is essentially a one credit course, which is a 14 hour module. The student takes every semester. Okay. And they do things in theater, music, movie making, Madhubari painting, Kalamkari painting, dance, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I'll show you a little more as I go along. Then this course, I know little, very little about it, but this was started by Surya, who is a professor in mechanical engineering on a course called Engineering Art. Again, it relates to Maker Lab. So all the students were spending time in the Maker Lab that has been there with laser cutters and all kinds of things. And the title of the course was Engineering Art. Again, very different, very unique. Okay, Something that you don't find in a typical curriculum, either in mechanical or electrical or any other uh, department. You know? All course MTech option, these are there. BTech in AI, we were the first time, MTech, etc. These are all done things. We were the first to start an online program on executive MTech in data science. And here also there's a long story to tell. So this has become a very successful program. We charge them very heavily, by the way. And if I remember correctly, it was close to about, uh, we, we went by credits. So for every credit, I think we charge them some 20,000 rupees or some such thing. You know, uh, and, and they had to do something like, I think, uh, 50, 60 credits or something. So total fees came to approximately 10 lakhs for this online thing. This was only for working professionals, people who had worked in the industry for minimum two years and worked out very well. Another thing which I'm very proud about is to, just before I stepped down in 2019, we started an MTech program in climate change. We have a department of climate change. To me, this is the biggest problem facing the earth, facing the world, all of facing all of us. And I got vindicated by, by starting about this particular program because just I got the news about a month ago that Stanford University is starting a new school after 70 years. And the school is called School of Sustainability, you know, Climate Change and Sustainable Goals or something like that. Of course, they got a donation of $1.1 billion from one uh, Doerr family. And it is called the Doerr School of Sustainable Development or Sustainability. Okay, so this is happening. Then I keep getting news about UCLA that they're doing. So many American universities are going very heavily into climate change now. In a collaborative, I talked about it. It is not implemented. I hope it gets implemented. Let me quickly talk about fractal academic. So here, essentially, it is modularizing. As I said earlier, we don't want uh, 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 all courses to have the same things. The second part, which I felt, okay, is that I want to teach something very, very unique and exciting in the first semester itself, first, first and second semester. See, when the students enter, 
they enter with bright eyes. And what we do is we teach mundane courses. Again, my reference point is IIT, and this is based on student feedback. We teach courses on physics, chemistry, math. If you look at the IIT curriculum in the first year, we again teach PCM. And I used to have a lot of students coming and talking to me in Bombay, particularly. Say, Sir, we are here. Why? Because we are good at PCM. Now, a whole year has gone by, and I'm again learning PCM, of course, in more depth. I came to study electronics. Where is electronics? I came to study communication engineering. Where is communication engineering? You know, I was talking to electrical students. That's why they asked about these things. You know, so we said that, can we incorporate some of this early in the game? Now, if you make it modular, there is scope for doing this particular part. Okay. And that's what I'm saying. Generate excitement among the students in the first year. Okay. Also, interdisciplinarity. See, for example, if you look at one course I'll mention, you know, which I had been teaching for a long time, say digital signal processing. Okay. By and almost all, invariably, when I taught that course, only electrical engineering students were there, occasionally some computer science. Computer science often had their own DSP course. Okay. And I'm talking about IIT Bombay days. Now, if you look around today, DSP, the basic FFT and basic signal processing is used by civil engineers, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, everybody. Okay, but they are not in a position to take a three credit course from electrical engineering on signal processing. Why? Because after a while we get into too much math, which they probably don't need in their program. Okay, because that person only wants to learn how to use signal processing in a civil engineering problem and not get into Shannon's information theory and Shannon sampling theorem, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So our idea was that we will break the DSP course or signal processing course into two parts. One credit offered in the very first semester and two credits, which is advanced DSC signal processing offered maybe in third year. And this one credit will actually teach in a manner so that even a civil engineer can enjoy that particular course. And it actually happened. The class trend at one time was something like 40, 45 students in electrical. Uh, okay, So they all took DSP, but the total number of student population will be close to about 80. So there were 40 other students from other departments like civil, mechanical, chemical, metallurgy, who are taking the DSP course. Okay. So again, you can really do multidisciplinarity, which uh, NEP talks about, if you go into modularity. Okay. This pumping too much information, I'll come back to it in a minute. Maybe if I get time, I mentioned about it. This was a brief thing that we did. If you do a study in terms of credits, you see Berkeley has 121 credits for a BTEC program or what they call BS. And this is a rough distribution. Stanford 105 credits. This is a full four-year BS program, by the way. MIT 90 credits. Can you believe it? No university in India will say that, oh, 90 credits are enough to give a bachelor's degree or a B.Tech degree. After a lot of debate in IIT Hyderabad, we said it won't be one size. People can have anywhere between 125 and 135. Finally, what I found, computer science and electrical had 125. They went to the lower end, while mechanical... Uh, civil, they were closer to 135. But we did bring it down quite a bit from something like 150, 145, which is typically the number of credits in a BTEC program that you will find in most IITs. I suspect it may be the same also at IIIT Bangalore. And you may wish to look into this. Let me give an example of, a, this is the E department, okay, electrical engineering, first semester uh, 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 multi, uh, fractal academics program. A lot of this has changed, by the way. Okay, After I left, uh, the new leadership has some different uh, thinking. So, for example, we had something called an independent project. It was bracket one credit means 14-hour module. Okay, It was running right through the project. Though it is 14 hours, it's running right through the semester. We broke our sub semester into six segments, each segment of seven hours. Okay, And in some sense, that represents 0.5 credit. Okay. But that does not mean, you know, one credit, but running over all the segments. We had a course on digital fabrication, which is basically 3D printing, two credits. Out of that, 14 hours was spent on CAD, and the remaining 14 hours was spent on actually 3D printing using polymers, any particular object. You know, people would print all kinds of things, interlocking gears, or they may have a tank or an automobile or whatever they want. Maybe they downloaded some public domain software, they modified it, etc., and then they did the printing. So be it, but they had fun printing it. Calculus one, calculus two, classical physics, very standard electrical circuits, magnetic circuits. We got that into the very first semester. Typically this would be done in the second year. 
digital logic design, again, a 14 hour module, one credit, digital system design, 14 hour module, one credit, signals and communication. I just talked about DSP that is being done out here, one credit, internet of things. So I, the, those days when we started, inter IoT was just coming in. This is, I think, 2015 or maybe 2016. Then why should we wait till the fourth year to teach IoT? The basics of IoT can be taught quite easily in the very first semester, and we should teach them because our students come with the word IoT. They know what IoT means. In fact, some of them might have, out of fun, might have even used it. Then we started a course on bioengineering, and this, I believe, is very critical. Again, a 14-hour module, you know, I got vindicated in this particular course also when I saw CRISPR. Many of you must have heard of CRISPR. Today, CRISPR has become a buzzword, particularly in biological sciences or gene editing, okay, et cetera. So this bioengineering course essentially deals with gene editing in the very first semester. Then we have a liberal arts that I talked about, creative arts elective. What are the creative art electives? And these are all people from outside IIT, by the way. These are all practitioners. Practicing artist, none of them is a faculty. Okay. MK Raina, you might have seen him in some movies, the famous one being Tare Zameen Pe. He taught a course on theater. You know, I will not try to pronounce this Malayali name. It's difficult for me to do it. Okay. He taught a course on a, a performance spectrum. Then Jagruti Datta taught a course on pottery and ceramics. Shubra Gupta, Jagruti came from, she came from Baroda. Shubra Gupta, I think she came from... Uh, maybe Bhopal or something, you know, uh, I forget from not, maybe from Bombay. She taught a course on five days at the movies, a course on movie making. Vasudev, Carnatic music. Similarly, we had someone for Hindustani also. This is just a sample. You know, Shalini Kumari on Madhubani painting. Okay. Then various faculty members understanding the heritage of Hyderabad. So we used to have a tour. I said, you are in the city. You should know what's going on or what happened in the city. Arko Mukherjee. I, I don't know from where he came. Musics of the world, from the world. So all kinds of different music which is there. That's what Arko Mukherjee talked about. You know, Rajiv Ravi, again, filmmaking for beginners. So this is just a sample and we had a whole plethora. It is not that the same course is repeated. You know, sometime next semester, we may not have some of these guys. Some of these guys will come. Let me tell you, by and large, whoever came here, they were very happy to come again. And they should tell us, oh, we, we had a great time with your students. We enjoyed teaching this module. Okay, and we'd love to come again. Now, this particular module was not Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10.30 to 11.30, three days a week. No. They would typically come on a Wednesday or a Thursday. They would start teaching it and cover 14 hours, maybe Thursday evening, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday night, they will take a flight back to their hometown. Okay, I could do this because IIT camp Hyderabad campus is a residential campus. One has to see how one can do something similar to in a campus which is non-residential. Okay, I won't spend too much time on this. This again, I'll go through it quickly in a time if you want. And this is what we had in uh, computer science. This is a computer science program that you can see out here, okay, that they had for the first year, first semester courses. So we had courses in uh, digital system, logic, uh, discrete structures, you know, et cetera, digital fabrication, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to skip all this. They just kept it for in case there were questions. Okay. I'll just uh, wind up very quickly. If this is something I've talked about. You know, completely overall, the last part in bold is more important. And in some sense, I've said, talked about that earlier. Okay. Uh, and I think we need to kind of, you know, work on some of these things. The more we experiment, I believe the better we'll be able to tackle the challenge. I think we are not experimenting enough with our academic ecosystem. And the key things I know, digital, we are all doing it. CRISPR, not that much. Climate change. To me, these three are the most important components that have to be there in today's education environment. Okay. Concluding remarks. I will not repeat all of them. I've done it. I just emphasize one aspect. Let us bring fun back into education. Okay. This is my last slide. And I always like this. You know, I forget who. This is the saying that I have. I forget who exactly. It's there on the side. Can't read it very clearly. A truly great library contains something in it to offend everyone. And I think that is what education is all about. That a good education system has something in it to offend everyone. At least somebody should be offended. And I think this is what creates excitement in the education system. Okay, I'll stop here. I'll just take the opportunity to thank my faculty colleagues, uh, Dr. GVV Sharma and Dr. Sumana Chanapad, 
Chanapaya. Both are professors. Uh, I think GBB is Associate Professor Sumona is a full professor at IIT Hyderabad in the EDP. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor it was a very sure. wonderful interaction. I'm sure a lot of us uh, could relate to it in many, many different ways in both uh, faculty and students, everyone here. Uh, so may I just hand over to our director, Professor Das, sure. uh, for, uh, uh, for a few uh, words of thanks. And Professor Desai, thank you very, very much for a wonderful talk. I was thinking to come to Hyderabad seat with you for this, <laughs> listening to you. Now I've <laughs> got a lot of information with this uh, discussion and all. Thanks to our Sambat team. This is actually a, uh, a one kind of research come discussion uh, we happen in the research mainly. And your uh, thoughts, like a vision, and also you have a mission also you have accomplished a lot. Thank you again and looking forward to meet you. Thanks. Good. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Sambat sure. is a great initiative. Keep it up. And I look forward to meeting, of course, Professor Das in person and also all the others who participated sure. someday in person. Thank you so much. See you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Professor Shina. Thanks, Jaya. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah.